We are in uh, Lesson 25, Chapter 22. Lesson 25, Chapter 22. Uh, this is one of my favorite past, uh, chapters because it has so many good Proverbs that we actually know in them, but also Proverbs that truly strike a chord with all of us, or they should. Listen, folks, how many of you that whenever you hear a name called, a, a name of a person called out, you immediately picture something in your mind about that person? For instance, if I was to call out the name George Washington, most of you would think about what? That he chopped down the cherry tree and never tells, tells a lie. Okay, that's right. If I, uh, if I name someone like uh, Hitler, something bad goes through your mind. Or Saddam Hussein, or um, uh, Ronald Reagan, different things. You know, uh, John Morgan, the Stuart Rothberg, Emory Gadd. If I call a name, some image flashes through your mind about that person. Here in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 1, Solomon starts off by saying, A good name is to be more desired than great riches. Favor is better than silver and gold. What you have to remember is that intentionally or not, when you hear the mention of a name, some picture comes to your mind because that person has a reputation in your mind. In fact, what's interesting is we as humans will hear the name, let's say you hear the name of Jimbo. Well, you used to know a Jimbo who was really wicked. So when someone else comes along with the name of Jimbo, you immediately attach that wickedness of that old Jimbo with the new Jimbo until the new Jimbo proves himself to not be wicked. You might give him a chance, but always lingering back into the recesses of your mind is this thought about what you remember about Jimbo. Listen, we do this with lots of things, not just the mention of names. Every time somebody, I end up, every time I end up where I have to drink a Lipton, oh, I'm not supposed to tell product names. Oh, well. Oh, it's done now, okay. Well, I'm just going to advertise for them. A Lipton lemon sweetened iced tea in a can. You got it? You know, you pop the top off and you drink it. Those have a unique taste. When I drink that a tea like that, it does not matter where I am in the world or what I'm thinking about. The moment I take the first sip of that, I remember where I was when I had my first one. Okay, I go right back to that place out in Crisp, Texas, out by a lake. I know because that very night we were out. I had showed up late. I was the college youth and music guy to church, and the guys were going to have a camp out out there, and I had another function I had to go to, so I showed up late. And when I got late, got there, they were already doing this game where they were using inner tube tires and playing kill the somebody or whatever. So I got up. They say, you're it. Jim, you're, Jimmy, you're it, because I'm still Jimmy at this point in time. I haven't, I'm not being called Jim by now. And so I said, well, what's the game? said, run, or we're going to beat the snot out of you with these inner tubes, <laughs> as if inner tubes, you know. So I take off running. Now, I've been out to this place many times before. And so I take off running, and I hear them say, Jim, watch out for the bob wire. And immediately I remember there is one strand of electrified bob wire going across the property over to across the lake and everything. And so as I'm running, I make the turn to turn away from it and I hit that bob wire and I go running down that bob wire and it just cuts my legs all together and I'm going I'm feeling it while I'm trying to slow down I'm thinking I have got to roll out of this and so I decide I'm going to fall into the wire and roll out of it and in the meantime I'm thinking well this thing's not electrified at all and just about then is whenever you start feeling it go <laughs> and I roll out of it and I get up after I'm out of it, 
<laughs> and the guys are coming, Jim, are you all right? Jim, are you all right? And they said, we knew you were all right when you got up until you fell down again. <laughs> and I fell down again. So they put me in this, they put me in this uh, VW Beetle, which got a, it had a top on it. They roll the top back and they roll up the window. <laughs> you know how it is, VW, you know, a little stick shit. You know, we're talking about the old ones, with the, okay? And I'm going, oh, I feel like I'm a faint. I feel like I'm a faint. Here, give him something to drink. So they pop the top on that tea and they drink it. I will to this day remember that tea. <laughs> Because that's the first time, and I go back to that very scene. The same thing happens with names and with people. Whenever you hear a name, you remember what an interaction was with that person. It may be a relative. It may be somebody at work or whatever. The interesting thing is, if you have a good name, if you have a favorable name, then the response of the people will be favorable towards you. If you have a bad name, if you ha are, are despised, there will be that person will despise you even every time they hear the name, no matter what you do. And I know that's an absolute statement, but the truth is, people have long memories and short and, and long short forgivers. They don't forgive people very often, and so they may say, "I forgive you," but they don't really forgive you. And so the thing we should work towards, as this as Solomon says here, we should work towards uh, obtaining and having a good name and having the favor of the people. And that good name is worth more than any money you have in the bank. Whether you're poor or whether you're wealthy, it makes no difference. A good name is worth more to you, and it is worth more to you. It is because when you are in trouble and you have a good name, name, the people will flock to you to help you. If you have lived your life and developed a reputation that has developed a bad name for you, people will always be leery. Oh, there'll be one or two who will come and help you for a while, but they will not help you long term. I see it weekly as people come to my office asking for help. My first response as a minister of the Lord and as a minister of the assets that are given to me through my ministry from you who give who give to the church without strings attached, it is my responsibility to de um, dole out that money to people in a godly and uh, way that the Lord would approve of. So therefore, I have to ask questions. Used to what as a teenager? That verse. Than anything. She, your mother was correct. So as I'm asking these questions to folks, I say, okay, where is family? And I, I say it like this. Where in the world is family? Where is somebody I can call you today who, who call for you today and I will say I'm going to put you on a bus or I'm going to put you on an airplane and I'm going to send you to this place where a family member can take care of you. Who can I call that will say send her on, send her on. Of course, the other side of that is if I'm sending you someplace, I'm also packing your stuff up and moving it there also because I've learned my lesson on that. If I send you to Seattle, Washington, and your stuff's in Houston, do you know where you're going to be within 30 days? Back in Houston. You know where you're going to be if your stuff's in Seattle? In Seattle, okay? Now, you may be waiting for it to arrive in a crate, but it's coming to Seattle, I'll tell you that much, if I send you there. And they will always say, I have nobody. I have nobody. I have nobody. Well, then I'll say, don't you have any family? And, well, yeah, I've got a mom. Where's your mom? Okay. Why not? Well, she doesn't want to help me anymore. Okay, where's your dad? Well, he doesn't want to help me anymore. Where's your aunts? Well, they don't want to help me anymore. Anymore. You got that? Anymore. You heard the word? Anymore. Because... They do not have a good name among their family. So I look to them and say, if you have no family, why should I help you? Why should I have help you? You have named 10 or 12 people who are blood, who have the means to take care of you, you have testified, and yet they will not. Why? Should I help you now? Because I'm in need. Okay. Let's talk about that. Where are you getting the money for that cell phone? 
with that data that you've been messing with for the last hour while we've been talking. Because evidently, your need is not a need enough to talk to me solely. You're talking with other people while we're talking. Where's the need? Okay. Who's more important? For you? you follow me? So we, does that mean that I'm not going to help them? No. They walked into my office. That's like me buying lunch for somebody so I can tell them how the cow eats the cabbage. You know, that, that's how it is, folks. You know, if you're buying lunch, you can tell them what you want to tell them. If they're buying lunch, you better keep your mouth shut. By the way, that's in next week's lesson, just in case you want to know. That's in <laughs> lesson number 26. It's coming up. Solomon's going to address that, too. Some of y'all were in the 8 o'clock class this morning. Tom Joyce over here was in the 8 o'clock class. I'm trying to mention him in every one of my videos so that he'll have a good name. And he heard it this morning. We talked about that, didn't we? So, yes, we did. We won't talk about the other things we talked about. Why? Here's, here's this thing. Why, why does a person think bad about a person or a person think good about a person? Well, we know it's because of the experience that we've have, had with them. And all the wealth in the world cannot buy you a good name. You can be the wealthiest Scrooge in the world and they'll still call you a Scrooge. You got it? Okay. And so Solomon is, is absolutely correct in this. Verse 2. The rich and the poor have a common bond. Rich and poor. Wealthy and poor. Boy, I like this bass voice. I hope I'm sick longer. You know, I've always wanted to be 60, and now I've got that, and so now I've always wanted to be a bass, too, and this is sounding pretty good. I, it may not sound good to you, but it sounds good coming back at me. I'm, this is great, okay? I can take Rex's place in the quartet. The Lord is the maker of them all. The Lord is the maker of them all. And how much can be said about this? But whether you're rich or whether you're poor, it makes no difference. Uh, the Lord is the one who is in control of you, and he is the one that created you, and both of you in his sight, whether you are rich or whether you are poor, are equal in value. And by the way, both you, the rich, and you, the poor, need the Savior. Both of you. Good. Verse 3. Or verse, uh, yeah, verse 3. The prudent sees the evil and hides himself, but the naive go on and are punished for it. You know, evil just is every place we turn around. Evil. Uh, I, I am at the point now where I even believe that some of the greatest evil in this world is programmed in games that are played on machines that our kids can't get away from. Uh, we hand these games to our kids and grandkids to entertain them, and they load these evil programs where somebody is shooting somebody or stabbing somebody or hanging somebody or um, I could go into more graphic detail of what these games are and these games are just uh, out there by the thousands and some of them are being played so often that that becomes the norm in life for these people. Drugs are involved in the game playing of these things, and evil words and bad words and filthy, filthy things are said and done. And that normacy of what's happening in the game is then transposed into what that child believes is the normous, or a young adult, is the normacy of life. That that's how life is supposed to be. And so it kills and it deadens the senses of a young person or maybe even an older person uh, who thinks that that's how life ought to be lived. And of course, here in Houston and in all the major cities, 
to see that type of life, all you have to go do is go to certain areas of the town. There are areas in Houston where the police do not even go on certain blocks, and they literally, truly, to their own testimony, allow the people within those blocks to fight it out until the fighting has subsided, and then they go in to clean up the mess. That's how bad it is, and you're seeing what is being portrayed. A person who is truly a prudent person, a person who is wise, in other words, we see evil and we run from it. We run, run, run. However, the naive person who knows no better, just walks into it saying, hey, there's nothing wrong with this. Oh, it's just a little low game. Oh, it's just a TV program. It's okay. It, I can just watch it. It's my favorite part. Uh, you know, I, 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 listen, w when a TV program has the words like pretty little liars in it and all that is happening in that program is evil and lying that is going on, it's training our kids to be pretty little liars. It's training evil. It's training bad. Whenever all of our, our TV programs have a gay, lesbian, transgender element in every movie, every TV program seems to have to have that element in it, what is it training our folks? It's not training what the Bible says. It's training that which is opposite to what the Bible speaks about. Listen. If that was not a problem, we would not be seeing it in the early pages being handled by the Lord God himself in early pages of the book of Genesis. I mean, life has not gone on very long before the Lord is handling such evil. And now that evil is just spreading all over as the norm. And we are supposed to be tolerant of it. Tolerant. Oh, they're not tolerant of us. We're supposed to be tolerant of them. No, if we're tolerant, if, if we even show just one little, here's how what the Lord thinks about it, they call us all sorts of names. They come out with a fury upon us. Evil begets evil. So even though they may be sweet now, they are sheep wolves in sheep's clothing ready to come out and come after you. Those who do not know better can be lured into it. The college campuses are filled with it today. The places that should be the places of free speech in America, which should be our our college campuses where you can say what you think, be it on the conservative or be on the liberal side, it makes no difference. You cannot be a conservative on any campus today in the United States. If you do not have a liberal viewpoint, your reputation and your good name is no good name among those teachers except for just a few teachers. That's not an absolute statement. A few teachers will respect you, but even they are living quietly amongst all the liberal stuff that is supposed to be the politically correct. I am tired of politically correct. I am tired of having... I am tired of us having to put on the censuses whether we are of a Hispanic background or not. I am tired of us having to say, oh, by the way, uh, I am not white, I am not black, I am not brown anymore, I am Hispanic, or I am some other name, because we do not want to offend. Folks, listen, this is just the way it is. There are whites, there are browns, there are blacks, there are yellows. By the way, you can't do anything about it because it came from your genes that passed down through your parents. So whatever you are is whatever you are. And you can try to change your outside, but you cannot change your outside. And that changing your outside will not fix the trouble that's going on inside of you. You can try all you want, but it will not fix it. Evil is there. Prudent people will run from it naive people will walk into it and keep walking and get burned by it, and they will be punished by it. Verse 4, the reward of humility and the fear of the Lord are riches, honor, and life. You know, humility alone does not bring riches. He's not saying that. It does not bring honor and it does not bring life. 
It must be connected to the fear of the Lord. Humility and the fear of the Lord brings these blessings upon people. Now, during the time of Israel's wilderness journey, the Lord developed this theme back there in the wilderness, directing his people to humble themselves before him. Solomon, after the temple is completed, is visited by the Lord the night before the dedication is to be, be done on the temple. Solomon understands what the Lord says to him, and he understands the importance of the words that the Lord gives for him to deliver to the nation of Israel as a dedication of the temple on the following day. Solomon repeats those words uh, that were spoken to him the night before, and he says them in 2 Chronicles 7.14. This is part of that dedication that was directed to Solomon to give to the people of Israel, not to the Gentiles, not to the church, but to the people who are standing there as a part of Israel and the dedication of the temple. And 2 Chronicles 7.14, Solomon repeats the Lord's words, and here's the words. And my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray. And seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven. Will forgive their sins and heal their lands. Lord God, who knows everything, sees everything. He knows the future. He knows the beginning. He knows the end. He knows the start. He knew that the nation of Israel would not humble themselves before him. And they would not seek his face. By the way, folks, the words seek his face is a phrase in Hebrew that means accept the punishment from God for evil doings. Because everyone who sees the face of the Lord God is punished. Remember even... This is such an important point that the Moses said to the Lord on the mountain while he was in the wilderness, Lord, let me see your face. And the Lord's instruction to him was, I cannot let you see my face because when you see my face, you will die. I will allow you to see the back of my hand and the back of my back. And that's all that Moses is allowed to see. And even with that, the vibrant Moses who went up on the mountain returned back down with a glow upon him that was different. And everyone knew that he had been in the presence of the Lord because of the change that happened in him. He was allowed to see the hand and the back, but not the face. Because to see the face means that you're willing to accept the judgment or you'll have the judgment of the Lord. What the Lord is calling for Israel to do is to be willing to have the judgment of the Lord upon them, even though he will not bring that judgment upon them, if they will just humble themselves. It's a story of redemption. It's a story of forgiveness from the Lord for the things that they have done wrong. Well, Solomon presents it there. And Solomon is correct here in verse 4, the reward of humility. And coupled with the fear of the Lord or riches and honor and life. Honor and life. And what you need. Remember in the Bible, being rich means that you have enough for today. Being rich means that tomorrow you will have enough for tomorrow. Being rich in the Bible does not mean you have enough to take you through the rest of your life today. Being rich means the Lord will provide for all of your needs every day as they come. That's what being rich means in the scripture. All right. Verse, verse number five. Thorns and snares are in the way of the perverse. He who guards himself will be far from them. Perverse people do not realize. But in their evil plans and their evil desires... They are going to experience difficulties because they will suffer the trials of all kinds from the things that they have devised for other people. Look at Haman in, this, in the book of Esther. Haman devised a gallows for Mordecai 
And yet, who was hung on the gallows because circumstances rolled out? Haman himself was. So it is. Most of us in here have lived long enough that we have seen those who are wicked and evil and perverse in many ways. They have, we've heard the stories of those who live in the ghettos and the, and the uh, slums, and they live by the gun, they live by theft, they live by robbery. That's how they lived. And eventually, you know what happens? It catches up with them. And they die in that theft, and they die in that robbery, and they die by the gun. That's how it goes. The wicked people don't realize that they're here on earth as well as in eternity. Their very desires and their very uh, plans, that which are wicked, will be used against them. On the other side of that, for those who guard themselves from all that wickedness and from all that evil, they will be blessed from it. They will be taken care of it. But in the meantime, the perverse will see their fate come to them just as they've planned for others. It will eventually come on them. You've heard there is no honor among thieves. You have heard that thieves, uh, thieves and wicked people are only friends as long as the wickedness continues in the same line, in the same mindset. But as soon as one of the wicked people of a couple decides something else, then they begin to be being wicked towards each other. That's the way it is. Not so with people who are prudent, who are wise. We can, those of us who are prudent and wise, we can disagree without being disagreeable. For the wicked, they disagree, but they are, not, they are not, not going to be disagreeable. They're going to be disagreeable to the death of the, one of the other, whoever has the upper hand. Verse 6, good verse. Train up a child in the way he should go, and even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, folks, the Hebrew here actually says something else. I know this is the way we learned it. This is very close to the King James, the way I memorized it in Vacation Bible School. I am very thankful for Vacation Bible School. Uh, in my day in Vacation Bible School, we had a memory verse every day that while we were standing out in front of the church, getting ready to line up to go in for the opening service that we would have, in order to progress that day towards a prize at the end of the week, you had to be able to quote that memory verse to one of your teachers. And I, most of the verses that I know, I must be honest, I learned uh, from Vacation Bible School. And I learned them also when I became a leader as a youth in Vacation Bible School for all those who were sixth grade and under. I was memorizing them at the same time. One reason was because I was listening to them a couple of hundred times as they were checking them off of their list. Oh, yeah, that's right. Okay, you got it. Well, I had to know it. And I listened to it. It's true. We learn these things. Well, one of these verses that I learned as a kid was train up the child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. From it. But the actual Hebrew says this, initiate the child at the opening of his path. And the word opening means the opening of his mouth. In other words, what Solomon is saying here, as soon as that child is able to talk and able to speak and able to understand what you're saying to them, and they can converse back to you in answers that are true answers. In other words, they have understanding going on in their brain. That parent should at every opportunity give instruction in how to conduct yourself in your duties in dangers, in blessings, so that when that child must walk alone and make his own decisions, he will remember and follow the teachings. I remember, remember, remember when my Madison was four or five years old, how I had to instruct her several times to never walk behind a car, never walk in front of a car, and the place I want you when you are not in the car and someone else is in the car, I want you off to the side to where the person in the front seat, driver's seat, can see you and you can see them, but never directly in front and never behind. To this day, like clockwork, I don't even think she thinks about it anymore. 
I will get in the car and she will come out and she will look at me and look at me sitting in the driver's seat or her mother and she'll be off to the side and what we're basically saying is she's asking even though she's not speaking is it all right for me to get in the car and we have to shake our head up and down in other words she knows we see her we're watching her and she can take the door she's gonna be 20 next summer and last night when we were taking her when i got out to take her to a um uh, a play over here at san jack Knowing I'm going to teach this lesson, I was so reminded because I look up and there she is waiting for me to say, yes, you can get the door handle. Yes, you can. How many of us just were going to the car? We just go get in. I don't know how that got training got to her, but it is engraved, in, ingrained in her mind. Other things like ladder conduct, when you're using a ladder, things you should do and things you should not do. These were things we taught her when she was four and five years old, how to make sure it's far enough out so that it will not tilt back. Just little things we talked about and all that. And she just does them so perfectly. They're just ingrained. She climbs in the car and I never have to say, do you have a seatbelt on? Mama, I have to say, okay, we're going nowhere till you get a seatbelt on. But I've already heard the click. I've already heard it. Why? Because we trained her. You can do the same thing with godly things. From the early age, as soon as they can open their mouth and they can speak, and they will not depart from it when they are old. Verse uh, number seven. The rich rules over the poor. Well, duh. And the borrower becomes the lender's slave. Oh, how true. The mindset of borrowing money for everything only makes the poor poorer and the rich richer. I know we heard a debate last night where we heard some of us did listen to a debate last night to where the candidates are saying we need free community college. Well, what that means is that they're going to up the, the taxes in your area so you can give free college to the uh, to the community college, let them pay for it. We're going to pay for it our taxes. We need to let the, make the rich pay for more of this. Well, I got news for you, folks. All this taxing and everything of the rich is just taking away from the rich who provide jobs. Oh, but we want to give this money to these people, even though they're not working. We want to provide them with free health care. We want to provide them with free college. We want to provide them with this, and we want to provide them with that. And we want the rich to pay for it. Well, I got news for you. Whenever you do that, because of the mindset of those who have money and have learned how to make money, it just makes the poor get poorer and the rich get richer and the rich are just glad to pay 70% because that means they've got money extra. You know, I've said it all along. Never complain about paying taxes because paying taxes means you got something to pay taxes on more. You know, you know, if, you know, it's, you know if we hit 39% in tax bracket. That means we made $100,000 and we only have to pay 39000 of it in. We got a whole lot, mon a lot of money left over. Don't be greedy about that. Pay the taxes. Get over it. Because I'm telling you what, if you don't, it's going to cost you a whole lot more when they come and get it from you, okay? But for those who say, ah, I, I, can't, I can't go get a job because, you know, I can, I can only earn about $600 a month or they're going to take my disability away from me. Well, how much can you earn? Well, you know, I used to do this job and do that job. Well, how did you get disability? Well, we filed for it. Okay, was there anything wrong with you when you filed for it? Well, just between me and you, not really. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, you need to go get you a job and you need to get rid of disability because you can make a whole lot more. Oh, but I can't. Well, let me tell you what happens to those people who get disability and they spend their $800 or $900 a month that they think they cannot replace. Do you know who they're spending it with? The people who are wealthy. They're going and buying products that they think they have to have, like cell phones, the latest and the greatest You've heard, I'm just sick of cell phones. I'm just, 
tired. I'm, I'm thinking I'm going to put in my office. No cell phones allowed. That'll slow the business down. Because I've got people who come to my office that they cannot spend one minute without looking at their cell phone. Even children. That's right. I've got a few choice words for a cell phone. And they're not appropriate for this place right now. <laughs> I don't want to see them. I do not even like my cell phone. I do not. I do not. Folks, everybody needs time together. The rich people, when the poor people go and borrow from the rich, the rich charge them interest. Who's making the money? It does not make any sense to me why a person buys a $100,000 house on 7.5% interest, pays it out over 30 years, 30 years later, after it's paid off, they sell it for a $179,000 house. And they proclaim to me that they made $79,000 on the house. And I turn around and pull up the amortization table and say, you paid $100,000 for the house. It's 7.5% interest. And you paid $297,000 in principal and interest back to somebody. And you made money at $179,000? Sounds to me like you lost one hundred and twenty dollars someplace. Oh, but I made money. The poor get poorer because of what they do. And the rich get richer. Because the rich are going to figure out, no matter what law comes down, they're going to figure out how to provide and put the money in their pocket. They're not evil. They're just businessmen. The evil is really probably down with the poor who want what they cannot have. And what's so interesting, the poor don't give to the Lord. They really don't. They don't because they can't afford to give to the Lord. But for every one of the thousand that I convince when we're doing their budget to give a tithe to the Lord, they will come back just like Brother John has said too, and they'll say, I cannot afford any longer to not give to the Lord. Because once I began giving to the Lord, our needs were met. For one thing, it's worship to the Lord to give. Number two is they tend to get their priorities straight. I have to give to the Lord because that's my worship of Him. Therefore, I've got to make other arrangements. You see, when you're not worshiping the Lord truly, you don't make other arrangements. You just go off and do your thing. Yes, sir, Miss Cookie. It does need to be the very first check that you're right. 